What's going on, fish nerds, and welcome back. Just bringing you a species profile today on the peacock gudgeon. I showed you these guys last time when we introduced them into this 20-gallon tank, along with the Pseudomagill Gertrude species profile on them to come soon. But these little peacock gudgeons, also sometimes called the peacock goby, even though they're not actually a goby species, uh, they come from Papua New Guinea. And these gorgeous little fish, I mean, you look at how pretty they are. All this color, uh, they got the pinks, the yellows, the blacks, I mean, the little blue on there. I mean, just a gorgeous, gorgeous fish. And these guys are an excellent little nano fish. They only get two to three inches long. Uh, the females almost two inches and the males almost three inches in length as mature fish. So they don't get too big. They don't need a whole lot of tank size and they're just super sweet. So let's talk about how we keep these guys. And uh, peacock gudgeons can be kept in tanks as small as 10 gallons. Uh, if you're just going to keep one, you know, or uh, maybe a pair. But if you're going to have a group of them, you know, and have several, I would probably say go to a 20 gallon tank. Or if you want to keep them with, you know, a schooling fish like I do with these uh, Pseudomagill Gertrude. Maybe get a 20 gallon tank so you can have, you know, more than just one or two. But if you just got a 10 gallon tank and all you want is one or two fish, I think these guys are a great option. You know, they're gorgeous little fish. They're out and about, you know, so it's going to be a fun tank if you've got these fish in there. But they like to have lots and lots and lots of cover. Uh, these are a fish that are kind of cave and crevice dwellers. They like to stay on the bottoms. Uh, and you know, have plenty of places to hide and they will be a shy fish if they don't have places to hide. I know a lot of people and I was guilty myself when I was new to aquariums. People tell you, oh, this fish wants a lot of places to hide. And then you're like, no, I don't want to give it a bunch of places to hide because I don't want it to hide. I want to see it. But if you've only got one or two places to, for it to hide, it's going to hide. And you'll notice a lot of times when you see these guys in your local fish store, if they don't have much cover for them, they'll stay right down next to the gravel and they won't move around a lot. And they may stay hidden in a corner. You know, if there's only one piece of cover, they'll stay hidden under that one rock or in that one cave and they don't really like to venture out. But as you can see here in my tank, when you give them all kinds of places to hide, all kinds of nooks and crannies, caves and crevices that they can duck into, it makes them feel comfortable knowing that if they need to hide, they can no matter where they are. And so that comfort level allows them to get out and about and you'll see them swimming around. I've never seen this group hiding at all. And uh, they're just always out and about and they'll even come up into the mid sections of the water, you know, especially at feeding time coming closer up to the top to get food. And they're just really active and you won't get that activity if you don't give them plenty of places to hide. They thrive on having the ability to hide even if they don't do it. And as far as, you know, water parameters for keeping these guys, I mean, it's not something that I would stress about. Anything from, you know, like a six to a seven and a half pH is going to be just fine for these guys. Temperature wise, you know, anywhere from 72 to 78 degrees. So if you've got them in a room that you're keeping, you know, at 68, 70 degrees, like most people keep their thermostats, if you, you know, you just got it in your living room, I would recommend a heater to get it up into the mid 70s. But other than that, I mean, they're not demanding. They're, they're really not a demanding fish at all as far as all that goes. Just make sure they got clean water. Keep up with your water changes and everything's going to be just fine there. And as far as tank mates go, you've got a lot of options because these guys, they're not an aggressive fish. They're very peaceful and uh, they get along well with others. They play well with other small peaceful fish. Obviously, don't put anything in there that would eat them. And you may want to avoid things that are, you know, super boisterous that hang out around the bottom that are going to, you know, bother them. But any other peaceful fish, you know, any nano fish, they're going to do just fine with those. And myself, I think they look awesome as just a little pop of color in front of, you know, a school of some other nano fish. You know, I've got mine in here with the Pseudomagill Gertrude, and I think they look awesome. Their colors complement well. You know, they... Uh, inhabit different parts of the tank so something like that I think is a great idea but you can keep these guys really with any 
you know, small peaceful nano fish, anything that's not going to bother them, they won't bother it either. So you really shouldn't have any problems finding good tank mates for these guys. Now, as for feeding these guys, they kind of have a reputation of being finicky eaters and only eating live foods. In my experience, my own opinion, I think that's exaggerated. Maybe that used to be the case, but all the peacock gudgeons I've ever had have all accepted dried foods. But you will read on the internet that, you know, they only eat live foods. You got to give them Daphne and live black worms and things like that. And they are, you know, micro predators, so they do prefer and they enjoy live food. So if you can do that, by all means, you know, throw some live blackworms in there. They will thank you. I mean, they're micro predators, so that's what they do in the wild. They eat little small bugs and crustaceans and things. You know, anything that's alive that'll fit in their mouth, they'll eat it. Which, going back to the compatibility, if you are keeping them with cherry shrimp, you won't have very many baby cherry shrimp because they will eat baby shrimp. Uh, but you know, I, in my experience, they've always accepted dried foods, whether that be, you know, granules like the bug bites or even just crushed up flake food. They've always taken it readily for me, but granted they do prefer the live foods and I think it's good for them, you know, so if you can do that, that's awesome. If you just can't handle doing live foods though, I don't think that rules out having this fish for you. Maybe there are some individual fish that are that finicky, but I've not come across one. And uh, most people are able to do at least frozen foods. So if you can incorporate frozen foods into their diet, you know, things like blood worms, uh, frozen Daphnia, Cyclops, that kind of stuff, they'll enjoy that kind of thing as well and would also be great for them. You know, frozen brine shrimp is going to be great for these guys. They'll eat that up and absolutely love that and love you for it. Uh, but yeah. Feeding, they have a reputation, but I don't think they truly deserve the reputation that they have. In my experience, they've been pretty easy to feed, and they'll accept basically everything, or at least the ones that I've kept have. Maybe you end up with one that's finicky and only eats live food. That's not been the case for me. And now the fun part, breeding these guys. Uh, peacock gudgeons, when it comes to breeding, they're actually very similar to bristlenose plecos. In that the male will choose a cave or a crevice, you know, some little hiding place. He'll choose it and he'll just kind of hang out at the entrance and he'll invite the female to come inside. And, you know, after she accepts his invitation, she comes in, she starts laying eggs. And while she's laying eggs, he guards the entrance and then he'll go in and he'll fertilize the eggs. He'll go back to the entrance and guard it, fertilize some more eggs. But once all the eggs are laid and once he's fertilized all the eggs... He kicks her out and she'll lay like 50 to 100 eggs at a time, but he kicks her out and just like a bristlenose pleco male, he will stay in that cave and he will guard those eggs. He'll fan them to make sure that they don't get any fungus and he takes care of them until there are free swimming fry. And so that's why I say it's very similar to bristlenose plecos. They do basically the same thing. The male chooses a cave, invites a female in, she lays eggs, he kicks her out and he takes care of the eggs doesn't even venture out for food until those fry have left the cave. And these little peacock gudgeons, they operate in basically the same way. Um, to breed them, though, I wouldn't just leave them in the same tank the way I do bristlenose plecos. When I breed those, I just put the adults in the tank and let the babies grow up in the same tank with the adults. With peacock gudgeons, if I was going to breed them, I would actually take a pair and put them in a separate breeding tank that's got lots of caves in it. And once they have bred and you get to the wriggler stage, or especially by the time the fry are free swimming, I would take the adults out and put them back in their permanent tank and let the fry grow up in that breeding tank. Because once they get to be free swimming, I'm not confident that you would get a good turnout of fry by the end of it, eventually, I think they would start picking off their fry. So I think in order to maximize that, that's what I would do. And uh, I haven't really read a whole lot of breeding reports. Maybe somebody would come on here and say, oh, no, no, they never eat their fry under any circumstances. But with them being a micro predator, I have a hard time seeing that they wouldn't eat any of them. You know, bristlenose plecos are vegetarians. They're never going to eat their babies anyway. 
you know, they will eat f- other fish's eggs, you know, but they're generally vegetarian omnivores, uh, or omnivores that tend to be vegetarian. These peacock gudgeons that doesn't apply to them. They're, they're micro predators. So I think you would definitely get a better yield if you remove the parents and leave the babies in the breeding tank to grow up separately. And guys, I think that pretty well covers the basics of what you need to know for peacock gudgeons. Honestly, I think these are an easy little fish. Uh, as long as you get one that accepts most foods instead of needing live food all the time, I think this is a great little fish for pretty much anybody, even a beginner fish keeper with a 10 gallon tank that wants something that's neat and colorful, you know, and isn't, you know, maybe you're the type of person that you think guppies are boring because everybody's got them, but you want something small and colorful for a 10 gallon tank. I think peacock gudgeons are a good choice. And uh, again, it, something I forgot to mention, if you get a group of them, make sure you get more females than males. And uh, the way you tell the males from the females, one, the males are bigger, as I mentioned, but also the males just have yellow around the edge of their dorsal and anal fins. And the females will actually have a little black trim around that yellow on the edges. So that's how you tell the males from the females. I forgot to mention that earlier. But I hope you guys enjoyed this species profile. I hope if you had any questions about peacock gudgeons, about how to keep them, feed them, breed them, that this answered those for you. And if you're considering getting some, I say go for it. But thank you guys so much for watching this video. I will see you guys again next time. But until then, God bless your fish nerds. You guys are awesome.